Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast, brought to you by Workman Forensics. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. I'm Leah Wheatholter, CEO of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Joining me today is David Mills, obviously not the late writer producer of NYPD Blue, but rather the pseudonym for our guest today. David picked up technology from a young age, which eventually led to a low-level job in the IT retail sector and resulted in a career in the corporate world as a senior network administrator. Looking for new challenges and a paradigm shift, David moved into the cybersecurity field, putting all of his years of experience to use as a consultant undertaking authorized simulated cyber attacks on computer systems, known as penetration testing, digital forensic and incident response, DFIR, training at a private college, and specializing in open source intelligence. Over the years, he's taken on a wide array of cases ranging from internet subcultures to fraud to missing persons, as well as discovering flaws in a mobile carrier and other security research. Thank you for joining me today, David. Thanks for having me, Leah. I've been listening to your podcast for a while. Uh, I've learned quite a lot, so I'm glad to uh, glad to hop on here and share. Well, hopefully I can uh, share some of my experience with the listeners. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, you have a lot of experience with a lot of different cyber and digital for, uh, investigations. So today I'd like to focus on Bitcoin. We haven't really talked much about that, but obviously it's a popular topic right now. Um, but I'd like to focus on Bitcoin from several different perspectives. So we're going to start with what are some common Bitcoin scams that you've been seeing lately and how do those work? Some of them are part and parcel of uh, MLMs, the multi-level uh, uh, marketing schemes. Uh, your, your, your previous podcast, I think uh, uh, Stacey Coonan uh, spoke, spoke about that a bit. Um, and some of them rely on that. Some of them are just straight up Ponzi schemes. What I noticed was a little while ago, obviously we're all in lockdown because of COVID. And I noticed, what well, I sort of, I figured that was so, was, so much time on their hands, people would get up to no good. Uh, folks were desperate, folks weren't working, money was thin, jobs are scarce and so forth and sort of globally. Um, so something I did notice that these, these Bitcoin schemes, it definitely amplified them. You see the same thing if you're dealing with a, with a black hat hacker, for example. Uh, you know, hacking is not a five minute, you know, plug in a tool essentially and, and it gets done. Uh, you know, it's, it's preparation, it's timing, it's... Um, you know, it, it has to be well orchestrated and it does require a lot of time, uh, you know, trying to break into things and doing recon, uh, trying to you know, decrypt passwords and, and so forth. So I started to notice more and more of them and take a bit of an interest in them. I, to be honest, I've always kind of avoided Bitcoin. Uh, it kind of irks me a little bit because, you know, it's kind of like how social media misappropriates the internet. The internet was a, a far different place when I got on it, you know, so many years ago, and now it's sort of um, it's sort of held captive by, by by social media. So whenever something you know that's new to the general public comes out, I kind of get a bit annoyed. And I, you know, folks will tell me, "Have you heard of this Bitcoin thing? It's amazing." And I'm like, "Yeah, I knew about it a long time ago." Um, it's it's an awesome technology for sure. Uh, it, it's definitely. Uh, uh, in, in this sort of niche and from the criminal aspect, it's absolutely abused. It can be used for so many awesome things. Um, but, but, the, but the schemes that we're seeing now, obviously, it, it, it's, it's not. Uh, and you can, you can say the same for everything. It doesn't necessarily make Bitcoin bad as a technology. It's very viable. Uh, uh, it, it's the same as peer-to-peer uh, -peer, you know, file sharing. You don't necessarily have to use it to download copyrighted material. You know, let's say if you were, were an independent filmmaker, you could make a film and distribute through peer-to-peer. -peer. So it's a very good, you know, uh, you could save on the hosting fees and all that stuff. But um, So some that I've seen are just straight up Ponzi. There's no way around it. Um, a lot of them have been factored into sort of this MLM. Uh, they, they create this this hype. Um, uh, I think what, what the millennials call it FOMO, fear of missing out. They, they create this uh, sort of framework uh, the sense of urgency um, to sort of pressure one into making a, a, a decision. Um, and they usually sort of the, the, the head of the snake is usually this somewhat charismatic character. Um, you'll see color psychology comes into play. Uh, they'll be wearing suits for, for whatever reason. Uh, you always see sort of something punctuated with gold, uh, but they seem to wear light blue suits. 
um, and obviously, you know, they're, they're um, snake oil salesmen of the highest degree, uh, but they're very charismatic. Uh, they, they talk a big game. They will say something like, you know, they'll, they'll uh, uh, drop something like, um, you know, Bitcoin's decoupling. And, you know, I've never heard of that before in my life. I'm not a, you know, a, a financial person. So, but if you say that to someone who's kind of interested and has heard a little bit about Bitcoin, you, you know, straight away run in the assumption that this person knows what they're talking about because they know more on the subject than myself. Uh, and hence that kind of starts the slippery slope. And in actual fact, uh, I'd say 99% of these people, their technical proficiency is non-existent. They, they have no idea what's, what's actually going on. Um, they're, they're very opportunistic as well. Uh, I, I lecture in my, my part-time, well, I'm a part-time lecturer, and something that I've noticed that I always, you know, uh, uh, I, I teach part of, some of the modules are on social engineering, and I say to the folks in the classroom, it's like, you just assume that I know what I'm talking about because I'm standing at the front of the classroom. Why aren't you questioning me? So, um, yeah, folks get roped in. Uh, it's, it's basically, the, it's essentially an MLM with uh, a Bitcoin component infused into it. So you're seeing family members roped in, you're seeing next door neighbors. I've got this business opportunity, business opportunity. And I think in, in Stacey's uh, uh, podcast, she mentioned, it, you know, she quite sternly said that it's not a business. And I can agree with her. I see these things echoed in this uh, environment. It's, it's not a business. These are not businessmen at all. Uh, actually, I was reading a, an affidavit the other day, which was referring to someone involved in one of these. And uh, they said, you know, Mr. X was a businessman. And I know it was like, no, he's not. He's actually a salesman. And he's also got a class action lawsuit coming up against him. Uh, and who knows who else is going to sue him because uh, he's just a sort of a, a he was an apex predator. Uh, he, he goes just selling different Bitcoin schemes all over, all over the place. And then, of course, you know, they can kind of anticipate when they're going to implode, as they all do. Um, the, the interesting one about the Bitcoin environment is the, the, how creative they get with the, uh, the implosion. Uh, you know, alien abduction, people disappear, um, you know, uh, some spec ops guys dropped in through the roof and kidnapped them in the night. Um, somebody else stole the money. Uh, we, we were hacked as well. Um, but of course, you know, there's no evidence. Uh, it's all unfounded. And, you know, they're writing this on social media while they're sitting on the beach with, you know, an 87-year-old pensioner's life savings. So in these Ponzi schemes, are they using Bitcoin as the investment or are they selling something else and then using Bitcoin as payment? Or are they trying to rope people into investing in Bitcoin? All of the above. They're all fundamentally the same, but they, they differ ever so slightly. Some, you know, there's, there's one, uh, first one comes to mind. They were uh, under the pretense of trading, oh, we all invest your Bitcoin for you. Um, they also were advertising as a Bitcoin exchange, uh, but they, they weren't an exchange. Um, they were just... Uh, they went on this amazing run where they actually had no products. They had no services in this specific one. They, they had no, nothing at all. Um, but a lot of them will also say, oh, we will invest your Bitcoin for you. And they, they sort of the, the marketing pitches, sit back, relax, give us your Bitcoin and we'll do everything for you. There's this cryptography and, and we've got these telegram groups. It's all very confusing. Just give us your money. And of course, it's fantastic for them that they're using Bitcoin because, you know, with most, you know, investigations, you always hear folks talk about follow the money. But herein lies the problem is that it's more difficult with Bitcoin. Um, so sometimes what they will do is they'll sort of anticipate, well, you know, the scheme's about to collapse. So they will tumble the Bitcoin. And when you tumble the Bitcoin, so when you have a transaction, it will go from wallet A to wallet B. And you can see that, that transaction. You can see all the transactions. But when you tumble it, it's effectively, it's, it's, it's money laundering. So it will take the contents of wallet B and then transfer the funds from that wallet into 10 other wallets. 
and from each of those 10 wallets into 10 other wallets and then distributes it, you know, small decimal points to all these different wallets scattered all over the place. And then sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the funds will reconvene uh, at, at the scammers or the schemers wallet eventually, and they'll uh, go to an exchange. They'll draw it out and they'll have cash money. Uh, or, or, or you know reinvest it. I've I've seen um, uh, this one lately where they seem to, as soon as you transferred the money into one of their Bitcoin wallets, they would draw the, the Bitcoin out straight away, and then it would be tumbled. So it's very difficult to find. And then my suspicion, I, I I can't say for sure, is that they took that money and then they put that they reinvested that in other people's companies, uh, in in tax havens and offshore uh, uh, countries. Um, Dubai seems to be uh, a hive of this activity. Uh, there's lots of people uh, sort of uh, gravitating around there because uh, you know a lot of countries don't have extradition. Um, uh, for whatever reason, the country doesn't seem to go after these scams uh, uh, too badly. Um, I mean, there's small ex exceptions. There was a guy. I don't think he had anything to do with Bitcoin, but it was a guy called uh, Hush Puppy. Um, was a student. I think he's, his Instagram still, his Instagram account still exists. Um, I think I think his thing was check forwarding scams or uh, something like that. I can't remember the exact story, but but so yeah, they always, you know, you always see the on their social media pictures of uh, you know the blue suits with the gold trim, the uh, the fake Rolex gold watch, driving a rented Bentley uh, somewhere in Dubai. It's always Dubai. Um, so it, another component that is difficult about these investigations is that it's on the internet, which means it's international. So let's say a, a, a Ponzi scheme or one of these Bitcoin uh, Ponzi schemes could start here in South Africa. What if you have a large contingent in, um, in the States or in Italy, uh, Germany, and so forth? It's very difficult to sort of consolidate that investigation uh you know it, it uh, even if you're in law enforcement how, how do you take all those people to task and how do you work with all those agencies and so forth so it's it, uh, i think the scammers and the schemers rely on that a little bit um it definitely does help them keep their tracks as well as the the bitcoin tumbling as well so it's not a it's not, it, it can be a, the larger schemes can be very very complex very difficult things to investigate for sure. How are some of these, uh, you know, the the ringleaders of the Ponzi schemes, how are they finding their investors slash victims? That's a good question. Um, some of them are just cold calls. If you go into YouTube, for example, and if you search for, for uh, Bitcoin, you're going to find a myriad of Bitcoin experts, crypto experts. <clears throat> and these are people... I think they have, you know, they have a, a, a tenuous grasp on mathematics, let alone something as complex as, as Bitcoin and trading and, and so forth. Um, what I've found is that a lot of folks, so mostly the, the tier one folks, so they, they're the ones always you know, at the top there. The tier one folks almost always have a history behind them. Uh, so, for example, they'll have a history of liquidation, um, uh, fraud, um, and also history of being involved in other schemes that are similar as well. So sometimes they, they're pretty easy to track. I, a lot of them, and I haven't often seen just appear out of the blue uh, and be inspired and just, you know, go off on this, uh, uh, this glorified, you know, Bitcoin fueled uh, Ponzi scheme. Um, and they, a lot of them I noticed also will hop from one pool of uh, uh, recruiters to, to the other. And then they'll, they'll share links uh, they will, will refer people. Um, you know the one, the one apex predator sales person that I can think of as well. Uh, you know, there, there's I saw a list of all the schemes that he's involved in, and and he he's hopped dozens and dozens and dozens, and they pay him a commission, obviously, because he's. I would say he's usually tier two, um, so he's got a lot of folks under him. Um, I saw some bank statements the other day, which showed his commissions and. Uh, he, he, was, he was earning some pretty good money just from the one scheme alone. Uh, and I would think if he has probably a good month, 
He's hedging his bets on all these different schemes. He could be making uh, it's probably a hundred thousand dollars a month, round about there, um, because you know just you don't always get an insight of to the actual figures because there's so much mysticism and deception uh, uh, with this as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, what's common as well is that they'll, they'll group a whole bunch of people in. That scheme will implode. And believe it or not, those folks will follow the tier one folks right into the next scheme. Uh, it, it defies it defies logic, but, but people do it. Um, I mean, I've seen uh, folks, there's, there's one scheme at the moment, uh, and there's like an essential, like a core group of, of uh, in- investors, and I use the word investor, the term investors very loosely, because then they're not investing, they're donating their money. Um, I mean, they followed these tier one guys, they're probably on their third or fourth iteration now. And you kind of wonder at what point do they run out of money? At what point do they realize, well, you know, that's failed, the next one failed, but, but the next one has to work. So, you know, the, the psychology comes into play as well. You know, they, they, they also target folks that, that um, you know, might have low self-esteem, for example. There's this feeling of inclusion, this feeling that you're part of something special. Uh, some of the more sinister schemes will, will say they'll, they'll go after public figures in law enforcement and, and various agencies and say they hate Bitcoin. They don't want to see you get ahead. Uh, the banking system imprisons us, financial freedom, financial freedom, and that whole that whole thing when it's an actual fact you know the law enforcement agencies are actually looking after the best interests of those folks and, you know that's what that's what they're there for so so yeah a lot of lot of harp a lot of mysticism uh, a lot of untruths we'll be right back to this interview at workman forensics we're your modern day sherlock holmes The team at Workman Forensics follows patterns to find money through forensic accounting and fraud investigation services. Using our data sleuth process, we build client cases telling the story of what actually happened. This process serves clients in the best way, whether they are going through a divorce, a partnership dispute, an estate and trust dispute, or a fraud investigation. So what is data sleuthing? Well, after serving clients in this best way for 10 years, we are proud of our technological improvements, making our investigations work similar to that of a manufacturing process. By following a consistent investigative and internal process, our team addresses client concerns in a timely, responsive, and thorough manner. But don't worry, clients don't go through this process alone. We believe communication is vital to the success of an engagement. So each client is guided by a highly trained and specialized expert forensic accountant along the way. And because we think data sleuthing is the best way to investigate financial disputes, we work to train other professionals as well through our investigation games, guided interactive workshops, and our Be A Data Sleuth seminars. To learn more about any of these services or trainings, visit our website, workmanforensics.com. In fact, our website is full of resources for anyone looking to learn more about forensic accounting, fraud investigation, or our data sleuth process. This includes blog posts, free Excel downloads, more podcast episodes, and links to our YouTube channel. So if you're looking to get into the investigation industry, or if you've been an investigator for years, we know you'll find something helpful in our free resources. So visit our website, workmanforensics.com. Welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, you know, I, I've i had this conversation with a friend of mine, actually. She is not in the investigative space at all, but just a really good friend of mine. We talked about how we had noted, and we've studied like business and marketing things together. And this concept that businesses are risky and so like, like that there's no strategy behind it, that it's just about striking gold. And I think that, you know, sometimes, I I mean, I'm a big fan of Shark Tank and things like that, but it's like, oh, if I just had that moment, then I would be able to make a lot of money instead of you can actually craft and build a business base and have strategies and learn how this, this system of entrepreneurship and business, you know, companies and even like, uh, cr- publicly traded companies and things like that. Like there's strategy and there's building that goes into that instead of, 
oh, I need a business idea that I then strike gold. And so I think that if that's somebody's mentality, because we've seen this, both of us have seen this personally in our lives, is that if that individual's mentality is, well, all of business is a risk and it's just about meeting the right people at the right time and kind of having this like, I don't know, you know, breakthrough moment, I guess, then I could see how someone like that. And in my experience, those are the people who are more susceptible to Ponzi schemes, to multi-level marketing, because they feel like that's how business works. You know, I, I'm amazed how many, and, you know, I don't know if I have Facebook friends that listen to this podcast, but I am amazed how many of my Facebook friends will start, will join an MLM and then turn around. That one doesn't work. Then they go join another one. You would think that that would, that the lack of evidence of success would like, oh, maybe I should try something different. But if they're equating business with like this chance, like there's a chance of this business happening instead of it being strategy and like something that you build, then there that's how that MLM Ponzi scheme could kind of be equated. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there. Um, you know, I, I think also a, a person in this sort of uh, in this day and age also if someone has their, their purpose taken away from them as well they would feel defined by joining one of these groups and it sort of uh, uh, gratifies them in a way that you know if, if they've lost a job or they're low on money or um, you know that something's gone on their personal lives where they need, need to connect with someone um, you definitely think that, that they seem to have an addiction um, there was I got contacted uh, I, I spoke to this one person uh, in South Africa and they've been taken, they claim for two or three million rand. Um, so that, that would probably be about $200,000, give or take the, the ever fluctuating exchange rate. And, you know, he was mortified and angry and, oh man, this is not right. And, and um, so I decided not to take that one on. There was lots of uh, anomalies that I wasn't happy with. Uh, there's just too much dishonesty and, and not enough clarity. And, you know, I, I, I'm, always, I'm always cautious of that. You know, I want to, I want to be, uh, if I'm in court, I want to be the expert witness. I don't want to be the person in the dock, you know, being grilled. Um, and lo and behold, about six months later, this very same person is involved in a huge scheme, which I'll talk about in a, a, a bit later. And there he is again, just forking over thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of dollars and like Matt is like can't you take up surfing as a hobby or you know skiing or something you know, where are you getting all this money from um and you know also going back to you know the products and services you, you'll see them uh you know the the the, the tier one guys t talking all these crazy things about uh you know this a big one is this encrypted phone well, it's sort of out of fashion now, but every now and again it would appear with different schemes and it'll be this magical Bitcoin phone that's super encrypted and James Bond would use it. And, and all it is, it's just, it, it's a Samsung generic Android device that has a gold cover. And when you boot it up, it just, the screen is different, which you can do. And, and it's, you know, I've got one sitting on my desk right now. It's, it's very low quality build phone. Um, but you know, it's, it's the crypto hop, you know, I, well, I've bought, I bought two Bitcoin. I'm on Telegram. I'm talking to all these guys, you know, and it's just this, uh, yeah, it, it just, uh, it defeats logic sometimes. Um, it's something I, I always hear often and not just, you know, with other, um, like I've heard it with extortion and fraud and things like that. Folks all say the same thing to me. They say, I can't believe that I fell for it. And I say to them, to be fair, you and I, we go to our nine to fives, we do our jobs and we have a level of proficiency at it because we're doing it every day and we apply ourselves and, you know, hopefully everyone's lucky enough to be um, in a job they like so they can be passionate about it and, and do well at it. And I say to them, you need to remember that these folks wake up in the morning and their nine to five is devising schemes of which to part you with, with your money. And they're very, very good at it. Um, you know, also the Bitcoin ones, I, I tell folks, well, Look at the returns. These are unrealistic returns. How is it viable for a company to giving you be or giving you back this higher return? It's just not feasible. A second sign is that 
what is the credibility? Does this person have a degree in computer science? Are they a cryptographer? Uh, do they have 20, 30 years in the IT field? Um, you know, do they have the equivalent financial experience? But these days, a crypto expert is someone with a Facebook account uh, with, with no actual experience. Then the third thing I tell folks to look for is that whenever you've been rushed into a decision, it's not a good thing. Because when I'm teaching social engineering, uh, I'll tell delegates, if you want to get someone to make a brash decision, create a, a time frame for them to work in. So you've got five minutes to say yes or no. Otherwise, this offer's off the table. And you, this is a great opportunity, and, and, and it works. It works with a lot of people. Uh, and then, you know, at the two-minute mark, you're like, man, you know, my friend went and said yes, and they did so well. And then before the five minutes up, you've got your decision. The tier one guy's got your money, and that's that's pretty much it. So based on the feedback that we get from our listeners, because we actually don't know who is, you know, which people are downloading our episodes or things like that. But if based on the feedback from our listeners, uh, we have a very wide range of people who listen to this podcast. And so before we get into your case study, because I want to make sure that we have enough time for you to discuss this case. Uh, if someone wanted to purchase Bitcoin, they don't have to go through these guys that you've been talking about. They can just go purchase Bitcoin. Where would they actually purchase Bitcoin? That's a good question. Yeah, they don't have to have anything to do with these people whatsoever. Um, you can just download an app on your phone uh, and then whatever exchange um, is, is sort of best suited to your needs, you can just go and, and purchase a Bitcoin through that exchange. Uh, some exchanges are bogus. Some are not reputable, but there's, there are large ones. Uh, I, I'm just I'm not going to mention any. Um, but yeah, and then you can go purchase a Bitcoin. You don't have to do anything with it. It's probably a, a, a good idea to do that. Um, uh, on the, the Lex Fridman podcast, he was actually mentioning um, someone gave him some Bitcoin. And before that, even though a lot of his guests on his podcasts uh, are heavily involved in Bitcoin, he never actually had any. And then he, he just created a wallet and then just went and, went and played with it. Um, I would avoid YouTube altogether, although there's one channel that I, I can recommend. Uh, there's a, a pretty smart guy. His name's Chris Trade. Uh, he's, he's, he's pretty savvy. Um, but also, you know, just obviously steer clear of folks that are uh, giving you financial advice as well because they, well, most times they're legally not allowed to. But it's, it, it's relatively simple. Now, also, the problem, how these, why these schemes are so effective is that Legislation can't keep pace with technology, and then a lot of these guys are uh, just skirting on the fringe. So you're seeing uh, a lot of countries clamping down. I, I'm not sure if it's still in place, but I, I believe Nigeria has banned Bitcoin uh, outright. Um, there's rumors of uh, uh, massive criminal organizations using Bitcoin to siphon funds and uh, uh, launder money, which is a huge problem. Um, there's there's another crime associated with it, but I don't want to talk out of turn. I don't know if it's actually an actual thing, um, but they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're intrinsic problems with it. Any technology can be misappropriated. Um, but yeah, but Bitcoin is not a, a bad thing at all. I, I think it's here to stay. I think I think how we use it and the form that it's in now will 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 change. Um, if you look at the old days, Betamax and VHS tapes. Uh, probably a bit more contemporary, uh, uh, Blu-ray and HD. It's whatever the market adopts becomes a de facto standard. So the cryptocurrency of choice might not even be Bitcoin. It might be Ethereum or, or something else. Um, but I would stick with the Bitcoin or the Ethereum. There are other coins. Um, I know like Atari is sort of rebranded. They're doing some interesting things. They're incorporating gambling into their business model. They're marketing it quite heavy. That's, and they're, I believe they're building these hotels that are gamer themed. So you know, uh, all the old uh, '80s arcade arcade, uh, arcade kids like myself will definitely go stay at one of those. But so there, there are some interesting spaces. It, it's just yeah, it's, it's difficult because there's so many voices telling you 
what to do in, in that space. But um, you don't have to be involved with those folks uh, at all. I'll give you another example of, of sort of how Bitcoin becomes almost like a virus is that you're going to find when you refer to your stats, I was having a conversation with a, a, a journalist uh, for a, a large a tech website in the UK, um, and he's their security guy. And he was actually saying that they won't run any Bitcoin stories. As soon as they do, their site is inundated with bots and spam and all kinds of craziness. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in your stats with the you know the SEO. It's got Bitcoin in it. And see what happens there. So you might have you know your your, your uh, listenership might go up a bit. <laughs> Well, that would definitely be exciting. Thanks so much for taking time to talk with me today. And if any of our listeners would like to learn more about your work, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, you could reach me on my website. That's uh, defplex.wordpress.com. That's uh, Delta Echo Foxtrot Peru Lima Echo X-Ray. Uh, for those of the listeners that can't understand my accent. <laughs> 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 and we'll make sure that we put that in the show notes. Thank you again for your time. Thanks for having me, Leah. Hey, investigators. I just wanted to stop in and let you know that we are going on a mid-season break until October 15th. We have a great season coming up, and we can't wait for you all to hear the amazing episodes we have coming. But if you're really itching for some forensic accounting podcasts, we highly recommend Kelly Paxson's Great Women in Fraud, as well as Trent Russell's podcast, The Audit, and many more. Be sure to check them out in the meantime, but don't forget to look out for us after October 15th. We hope you guys have a great fall, and we'll hear from you soon. Thank you for listening to The Investigation Game. For more information on any of the topics brought up on this show, visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoyed our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also connect with us on any social media platform by searching Workman Forensics. If you have any questions or topic ideas, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com. Thank you.